back in our first tour, I talked about how this would be a little dream of ours to turn this into a chicken coop. So this was an old nursery office. This was the office. Which I think you found a new purpose for. I am going to turn this bad boy into a chicken coop. <laughs> now this is not my ideal. <laughs> it's like the weirdest chicken coop. <laughs> this is not my ideal place for a chicken coop, <laughs> but I think this will be a nice little area. You for... think this is enough space for one chicken? <laughs> I think this is great space. You get electricity. You get electricity, you get, it, got, it has Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> and what's nice about it is that it has a concrete floor, it's insulated. It actually feels really nice in the summer months. It feels nice in the winter months. And it's a really protected small building. And I like to spend a lot of time with the chickens. So I kind of thought about it as like an extended room. And one of the great things uh, that we started to think about and do is refinish it. And we were just going to do regular paint in this, but we decided that we'd like to do clay walls, potentially in the, the meadow house down below. And we thought we'd practice it here in the chicken coop first. And we didn't quite know whether we wanted clay ceilings. We didn't know if whether it would feel too cave-like or confined or whether we would even like that. So we thought let's Let's play around here in the chicken coop before we actually do it in the meta house down below. We teamed up with Matteo Lundgren of Cobb Therapy to orchestrate the clay plaster. Because it was a process we were only remotely familiar with, we decided to pay a visit to one of the sites that Matteo had worked on. All right, so we are on our way to see Matteo, who is our clay plasterer extraordinaire and he just happens to be clay plastering a house and we're in town, so we're gonna go check it out. And we're not gonna be clay plastering the meadow home until I would say May, mid-May. So we're eager to, to check out his work and uh, see if it's gonna be a suitable fit for us. And Sonder even opted in to take one of Mateo's many clay plaster workshops to learn the ropes. So what are we doing today, Matteo? Oh, we're gonna put clay plaster all over these walls and they've, they've all been primed with a wheat paste clay sand primer. And what that does on drywall substrates anyways, it creates this like sandpaper texture. And you can see the little pieces of the sand that are stuck to the wall. So the wheat paste and the clay are like the glue that sticks the sand on the wall. And what that sand does is it creates these little ledges. So it creates mechanical grip for this clay plaster right here to stick to on the wall. It sort of like holds it. It prevents it from slipping down the wall, right? If this was a, if this was a clay or adobe wall, you wouldn't have to put a primer on it because it's like substances adhering to like substances. But that's what priming does, even if you're using paint. You know, it's like it creates a, a surface for the next layer to stick to. And it's good to let this dry, huh? Yeah, it really needs to dry and set up. And you can feel it. If you, if you could feel it with me, if you could touch it, it's yeah. just there. You know, it's there. You can pull some of the sand yeah, off, but nice. it's, it's there. So, yeah, we're going to clay plaster the ceiling and the walls today. Uh, it's a lot of work just getting the, the tools geared up. Gear it up. Geared up. I'm gonna switch this plaster into buckets so that I can start putting it on the wall, but I'll, since it's sat overnight, what I'm gonna do next is just remix it, give it a little spin. It's been hydrating overnight. It's been all so cozy in its, in its little home, its little tub home, waiting for its final final uh, destination, which is your walls, which is your walls. Water's a critical element in this process. How do you make an adobe home if you already have an existing, you know, 
conventional stud framed wall system and drywall everywhere. Uh, well, you do clay plaster. And so the mix is really just clay. You know, it's like about two parts sand to one part clay. And there's a lot of different variations of what you can add to that. Sometimes I add cow dung to it. Sometimes I add wheat paste to it. Right now I'm putting together this epic drill. Honestly, when you were mixing that yesterday, it made us both feel like we wanted ice cream and we both like, I got ice cream and you ate ice cream after. I know. <laughs> no, I really, after, we talked about it so much, we kept saying cake. <laughs> so I went home, I'm like, I was hungry for dinner and I was like, but I know what I'm having after dinner. <laughs> and maybe I'll wait till my daughter goes to sleep so I can really just slowly enjoy my ice cream because when you mix this, it does, it feels like you're a baker. Yes. You know, it a does. lot of people have the experience of like, whoa. And then, you know, it's funny because the tools you use, you know, that's a, that's a baking tool. What is yeah. that for? It looks like scraping the like sides. Of, yeah, or scraping the sides of, just like how you're using it, actually. Yeah. So, you know, getting the flour out of the sides right. and mixing it properly, or so, getting a cake out of a, you know, a tin. So, you know, when you mix in tubs, one thing that happens with clay, because it's such a great adhesive, is like, you know, you'll get little clumps. So you gotta scrape it off the side so that your mixer can really get them. So that you can have a nice smooth plaster so that when it comes off your hawk and onto your trowel and onto the wall, ooh, just glides. So in the morning, I just like to get it all I like to really stage myself. I don't like to rush, you know? It's like, oh, how do we get going? Because once the clay starts going on the walls, you know, you just don't stop. So we just like to fill up our buckets. I imagine that is heavy after a while. I mean, the clay itself in the bags is heavy, but oh, yeah. when you add the water and woo. You add water, you add sand. These are heavy, heavy materials. Um, but yeah, like I said, this is just clay, sand, and water, this mix. Um, and we've added wheat paste to this mix as well. And it's basically just flour and water. Now, wheat paste is used to make the plaster a little bit harder and prevents dust from happening in your plaster at the end. So when you're rubbing your walls, you don't get dust on your hands. Is it gluten-free? <laughs> uh, it, it, you do not want to use gluten-free. <laughs> no, it's the gluten not stick. Right, the gluten is. <laughs> the gluten is critical. The gluten is critical in this process. I'm sorry for anybody who has celiacs. Yeah, celiac or wouldn't would they be able to even operate around it? Actually, <laughs> right. Good question. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think so. I not think someone so. who's serious. Yeah. We would just use something else. But otherwise, it's non-toxic to the vast majority of people. That's correct, that's correct. <laughs> yeah, a lot of material, you know, if you talk to people that have done plastering work with more conventional products, it's not very, they're not very forgiving materials. There's a lot of set time, there's a lot of pressure with the material. And once you mix it, you gotta use it. You gotta use it. And why I love working with clay plaster and earthen plaster is like, it actually gets better if you let it sit. Isn't that amazing? Like you talk to anybody who's done this work, they're like, you mixed it and you just let it sit overnight? It's like a whole shift in thinking. It's another reason why I love it. Cause everyone's always like, wait, that can't be right. Clay on the wall? Yes. Oh yeah. Clay on your walls. We eat on. We eat off of clay, right off of our cups and our plates. And we should be breathing all the air that our walls give us. That are clay-based walls. I love it. I love thinking about just the clay creating the air, the air space in my my living rooms. To 
just filtering it. How did you get into this Mateo? Oh, I was, it's a funny story. I was actually living in LA. I fell in love with a woman and I moved to LA and I was living there. And she was an artist and what a beautiful artist. So I got to meet all these cool people that are doing all these cool things. And one of the things that I, I was about 27, 28 years old, and uh, I just started being around all, artists tend to hang out with other artists. And these artists all made money being artists. It wasn't, they weren't living the, I'm the poor starving artist uh, identity, right? It was like, oh no, no, this is the only way to live. And so that experience just sort of totally changed me. And it made me open up to a lot of things that I wasn't open to prior to that. And one of those things was natural building and I met people that were doing crazy stuff. And after I left LA because me and my partner didn't work out, I went right to Southern Oregon and did a cob apprenticeship. I was like, oh, this is it. It's the clay. It's Adobe. I want to build houses that don't require me to go to a box store. I want to like go to nature supermarket and, and make my own stuff. How long ago was that? That was over 10 years ago. Wow. And this has really become your life. This has become my life. I love it. It gives me life. You know, this is not work to me. It's just fun. It's like, how cool is this? I get to come to people's houses and put clay plaster on their walls. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, this is the silky smooth grolic clay. Yeah, this is powdered clay. Now, all clay comes from, you know, it's a, it's all subsoil, right? It's like, how do you find pure clay and powder it up like this? It's yeah. like, it's such a process. It's so pure looking too. It's, yeah. it, and it feels so silky smooth. I mean, it, it's like flour. I mean, yeah. it is, there's so many metaphors and similes to, totally. to baking. It's a lot of parallels there. And yeah. even, even when you're saying that it, sometimes the, it, it, it's better when it sits, like that's the same thing for some sauces and everything. Along right, sauces, right. You know? There's so many dishes where you say, oh, you know, grandma's dish, it's like so much better the second day, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, with clay, I mean, you can use site soil. It just requires, and a lot of people do, a lot of clients are like, oh, I want to use this site soil, but the thing is, is that you've got to dig up the clay, then yeah. you've got to screen the clay, and it's quite a process to get from the clay soil that a lot of people are familiar with when you're digging below the earth, like yeah. below the topsoil, and you see, oh my gosh, I think that's clay in there. Yeah. And to get it to that, you know, you're going through some super fine, you know, screens. Yeah, and we were thinking about that, but given the fact that we're doing so much on the renovation side and everything, it, we figured um, that this is gonna be a more efficacious and efficient way for us at this stage. Yeah, you have to have time. Yeah. It takes a lot of time to screen soil to this, to this level. Oh my God, and you might not even get it to that level. Yeah. And so, you know, sometimes you get a little piece of paper in there. <laughs> um, and then honestly, sometimes yes. it's the, the, the color of the clay, right, will affect the color of your walls. Oh yeah, yep, the color of the clay, the color of the sand. It all adds, adds to whatever color you can actually create with pigments. And this is just gonna be the raw sand and clay color. And you can see that this clay is quite white, but it's a creamy white, you mm -hmm. know? I don't know if you can catch that on the camera. Yep. But then it's like, there's lots of different sands and we've chosen this sand, which you can see is mm -hmm. like a, I guess, I don't know what you would call that, Summer. What would you call that color? Uh, I would say like a, I don't know, like a fawn color or something. I, or yeah. Some people may say a beige, but it has like yeah. a yellowish. It has a yellowish tint yeah. to it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then, you know, you think about this, sand is very important to this process. And sand has to be angular. If, it, if it's not angular, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna be strong and it's not gonna hold the clay together. 
So this piece of the, the puzzle is very, very important. And angular sand is where it's at, and that's what we've got here. Lots of little variations of different size sand here. And that creates sort of like a man-made stone. So imagine when we mix it into that, what we're doing is we're surrounding each one of these tiny little pieces of sand with clay. Um, and then what happens is when, I, when we press it up against this wall, that clay will start to dry. And when clay dries, it shrinks and then it tightens it all together. And what happens is when it tightens all together, you can imagine all those angular pieces, they sort of link together and lock and that creates the strength of the plaster. And it, whether it's cement or clay, whatever the adhesive is, that's what's creating the strength in the plaster is that, that sand, the sand is critical. So it's super fun to choose the right sands and to play with materials, whether they be from the forest or from a store. It's like, what can be, what can be used? And we talked about the color being affected by the sand and the clay, but you could also add pigments to it as well. Mm -hmm. And when would you add the pigments to the process? You add it right when you start the mix. So you want to add the pigment with the water at the beginning because mm -hmm. it's really, really important that we well, it was helpful for us when you invited us to that one job site that you had worked on because when we got there, we were, we were kind of more like, oh, let's go with more of this creamy white color. But then after seeing the natural color of the sand and this clay on the walls, we're like, hey, we, we like that too. So mm -hmm. sometimes it, I would imagine with clients, you just have to have them experience it so that they could have a more informed decision of what they'd like. Yeah, I feel like that's very true. You know, everyone has their own own aesthetic. It's like, what do I want? What color do I want? And um, I think why I love working with earth and clay is like pretty much anytime you put it on the wall, the color that turns out, it's so pleasant. It's such, it creates such a pleasant feeling because clay, it, this isn't just putting on latex paint onto your, into your house, right? What you're creating is you're actually putting a living material on the wall. And so there's a feeling with a living material on your wall that you can't get when you're putting paint on the wall. And that feeling, it's, it's like a live material. So it breathes in the space. It regulates humidity, it regulates temperature, it binds odors. You can smell it in a super humid, there's like a smell, a rich smell to it, but it's actually alive. And there's no on and off switch. It's just, it's just doing it. It's like what every green building material like strives to do. You know, it doesn't use any energy, it's just alive. So it creates that electrical field like human beings. We all have this sort of energy about us, this electrical field around us. And that's what's being put on these walls now. Is like, imagine this small electrical field of clay energy. It feels like a cave. People love it. And now back to the mixing. Now we're ready to add the, the meat of our material here, which in mixing, you always, you always add a little bit of sand. And then I guess I'll just put that in there first. So there were still the dredges from the previous mix. Mm -hmm. And I really like to, to mix where I don't empty a empty the whole batch. I like to mix on top of the batches. Now that clay goes on top and we've got ourselves our flour. And you really want the you really want the um, there to be a lot of water when you're mixing the clay or else you'll get a lot of clumps. I like that part. I know. This is one of my favorite trowels. A little just 
all around nice semi-rigid trowel. There's a little flex to it. As you can see, there's these spines and trowels. So each, each trowel is a little bit different in shape and then in flexibility and then in thickness. Um, this one's a cool German trowel that I really, really like and it's, it's got flex, but it also has some stiffness in the center. So it's a nice, uh, it's a nice one to come through after plasters on the wall. But a nice rigid trowel, you know, you see this spine's way up here, but if you look at more of the, the finished trowels like this one, this is a Japanese trowel, it's very thin, but it's super flexible. So if you were to plaster on a wall like this, it doesn't hold the same, um, it's very hard to keep a consistent pressure along this whole edge when you're, when you're plastering. So you wanna have a semi-rigid trowel, if not rigid trowel, when you're doing your base coat, your, your first coat. What kind of metal are they typically made out of? Uh, stainless steel, uh, definitely steel. Steel is a, like that's what all this is, is steel. Um, How do you care for your trowels? Oh, keep them clean. Keep them clean. We've got to keep them clean. Um, you can see I teach workshops. So what happens is, um, you can see with this one, this one I need to do a little love on, but when you keep the water and the clay on it, it starts to oxidize the metal. I was going to say stainless steel, it gets, it get, could get rusty. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, you know, I let people use my trowels and it's a different game. It's a different game when you let people use their trowels. But if you look at this trowel, now this is the workhorse if I'm doing straw bale buildings, but this has no flex to it, right? So this is going to create a consistent, you got to create con consistent pressure, but this is going to create like a really flatter wall surface. Um, a trowel like that. No, I love this trowel. So, the way this game works is I'm gonna start in the corner. Since this looks like the most annoying spot in the house, <laughs> is the door. Right now, I'm just priming my board. And that is just getting material on the board so that it's ready for when I load her up. Cause I'm going up, it's time. I'm ready now, to elevate the walls. Yes, so this is a, this is somewhat wet. We'll see how, I'll get a good feel for what I want today. But this is, a, this is a wet one. Hopefully that means it'll make it easier for me to, to get it on the, on the wall. Here we go. Look at that. And then you do that about 2,040 more times. Wet. Just takes a And this is what it looks like. So you can see it's still drying. Sonner, you had mentioned yesterday that it looks a bit more like clouds when it's drying. But it's hard to explain or communicate how it feels in here. But as Mateo was saying, like this is 
It's nice and porous. You could feel the humidity. The walls feel very nice and it has some kind of texture to it. You could see the nuance of the strokes as well from the brush. And it's taken on the color of the sand that we've used, which we found out from an old sandbag actually is a little bit darker, but this should, it's because it's still a little wet, it's going to actually start to get a little lighter. So you can see some of the lightness in here. There's still a lot of work to be done. Obviously we just did the walls and we may take this old vinyl tile out of here. And then we think we're going to do a board and batten on the outside of the chicken coop kind of in that iconic barn red color. And then you'll see that this is attached to another barn that we haven't really utilized that much, but it has good bones. It has, it's a nice pole barn. It doesn't have a finished floor. It's no concrete floor, but we were discussing the other day. And so this is to be determined that we might maybe take it down a notch so it's not so tall and turn it into a large enclosed chicken run I like the idea of free ranging chickens, but I'd probably do it under, you know, where I'm watching them because I have zero tolerance <laughs> for chicken death. Um, I wouldn't say zero tolerance. I've been able to, to deal with it, but I would hate to see like a hawk or a fox uh, or a marten or something like that take a chicken. And so free range them when we're actually watching them and then maybe put them in an extended run. But Still a lot of renovation and refurbishing that needs to be done and we don't even have chickens yet, but like to get this done before we put the cart before the horse as they say. Really fun project. I didn't, I didn't get that involved in the clay plastering, but it was a, a good place to practice so that we know what we wanna do in the uh, meadow house. Stay tuned here on both of the developments of the chicken coop and the meadow home. And if you find yourself enjoying the videos we produce, we'd love for you to consider subscribing and hitting the notifications button. It makes a big difference for the channel, plus we're committing 10% of our Google AdSense revenues back to the Finger Lakes community, which is matched by our friends over at Espoma Organic. So your viewership and support makes a positive impact.